It's an absolute pleasure to be here. So I've been given the unenviable task to talk about myeloma in about 40 minutes, and I've spent 25 years in the field of myeloma, um, and still we haven't covered it all. So I'm going to do my best to give you a little bit of flavor and to, um, as I said, my role is to help make sense of myeloma and interpret it for you, um, give a little bit of a disease overview, how we treat myeloma and some of the common side effects and problems. Um, but it is a big, meaty um, uh, blood cancer with a lot going on, and it will be hard to cover it all. So if there are things that are particularly of interest to you in the room that we don't get to cover or you want to know more about, please do come and talk to me during a break. Or we're, do, we're repeating it again, Myeloma 102, this afternoon, where we'll go through it again, and that's another opportunity as well. Um, so I'm going to start with um, uh, introduce you to uh, a patient of mine. Um, this lady is called Eva, and this is called the Myeloma Marathon New Zealand style because she is from New Zealand, even though she's living in Australia and Sydney and we're looking after our RPA. And um, patients and, and their families and caregivers really do give me inspiration to um, help manage and care for people with myeloma. Um, and I learn so much from them, from their questioning and their feedback to me. And this is Eva just a few weeks ago, having completed the Sydney to Surf Marathon in record time. And... Uh, she has had myeloma for a couple of years. She's been through a transplant. She's had another few lines of treatment. She was actually on triple therapy as she was running this half marathon and is preparing to go into another transplant. So this lady is living with a lot. She's on a lot of medication, doing a lot of stuff, um, yet uh, she also completed an MBA while she was in with us having her transplant um, and volunteers at the Cancer Council. And even running this marathon, she was raising money for the Kids Cancer Hospital. Um, and then she was on the blower to me on email saying I've got this side effect and this problem and hey here's some photos of me running a marathon. Um, so you can live well with myeloma um, and Eva is my inspiration. So what I'm going to try and cover in the next 40 minutes or so is a little bit of an overview what is myeloma, some of the tests and investigations that you would be quite familiar with and explain why we do them. I'm going to touch on how we treat myeloma. Um, there are a, is an absolute explosion in the number of drugs and treatments for myeloma and I'm a nurse consultant but I'm not a doctor. I don't prescribe and I don't direct your treatment but I do spend all my day helping it make, helping, um, make sense of the treatment to patients so I'm going to come at it from that angle. We'll talk about common approaches um, but also some of the supportive measures, how we look after bone and kidneys um, and also most importantly how we manage some of the side effects and consequences of some of these treatments and I'm going to focus on the um, on peripheral neuropathy and steroid uh, effects. And we'll just end touching upon some of the newer treatments that are just around the corner and where we're going with myeloma. So myeloma, often called multiple myeloma. In this talk, I'm going to drop the multiple. Um, it's the same disease. I remember a patient saying to me, oh, no, dear, I don't have myeloma. I have multiple myeloma, as if it was far more important than myeloma. Um, it is the same disease. So if people are using the different language, um, it's the same. We sometimes call it multiple to help distinguish it from melanoma, which it is not, um, and also to, to let you know and um, to describe the fact that it can affect multiple parts of the body, but it's the same disease. It's a cancer of the bone marrow plasma cells, all well and good if you know what a cancer is and if you know what a plasma cell is. Well, cancers are a group of diseases, over a hundred of them, that uh, describe um, a condition where the normal healthy cells and tissues grow out of control and don't perform their um, function normally. So they're homegrown diseases. They're parts of us, cancers. Plasma cells are immune cells that live and grow in the bone marrow. We all have them. And these are the cells that produce antibodies normally to help us fight infection. So when you have multiple myeloma, you have these plasma cells in your bone marrow growing in number and out of control and function. So you have too many. And so the consequences of that are the hallmark of the disease. 
Um, myeloma is characterized by damage to the bone marrow because this is where these myeloma cells grow, damage to the kidneys because the myeloma protein floats around in the blood and can get caught in the kidneys, and damage to the bone because these myeloma cells live and grow within bone and disrupt the normal turnover of bone. Um, it, it is said that you know the body is constantly growing and, and repairing and replacing its cells. And I read somewhere that we actually grow a skeleton, a new skeleton, every seven years or so. So um, what happens with the bone damage is that these myeloma cells disrupt the ability of your bone to repair itself, um, and you can get little lytic lesions, which can be quite painful and can um, unfortunately fracture sometimes. And we'll talk about that. Um, you've had a bit of a session, and I'm sure very many of you in the room are quite familiar now, um, more so than you would like to be, with your blood system and your bone marrow. But this is a bit of a, um, a schematic picture of your blood factory. Um, blood is manufactured within the bone marrow. This is the bone marrow with all the blood cells that grow, and it starts with a hemopoietic or a blood stem cell, which divides into all the other blood cells within the bone marrow and the blood system, which are all very useful and handy for us to function. And myeloma fits in when there is some sort of error between the division of these stem cells and this particular um, cell line here and the plasma cell. So as I mentioned, plasma cells are normal. We all have them. There's about less than 5% in the bone marrow and they produce antibodies to help us fight infection and what happens in myeloma the hallmark of cancer is that cells start to divide abnormally due to some kind of error in the DNA of the cell is that these plasma cells grow in number and when they normally produce antibodies that help us fight infection what happens is we have far too many of these plasma cells in the bone marrow so instead of having about 5% we might have 30 40 50 percent and that over crowds the bone marrow so those other cells can't grow effectively, which explains why you might be anemic or your white cells might be lowered um, and your blood might not be functioning normally. And so in terms of these plasma cells that live and grow in the bone marrow, they can cause effects on the blood system and the immune system. The kidneys, they can cause damage. They can also cause some damage to the nervous system because I mentioned peripheral neuropathy or damage to nerves is a hallmark of this disease caused mostly by the treatment. But actually this abnormal myeloma protein can cause damage to the nerves and you might get some peripheral neuropathy, which we'll talk about. We've mentioned bone disease and on top of that, as we start to treat the myeloma and get it under control, some of the tablets and the treatments that we give you can cause effect as well. So the impact is um, on mainly on these parts of the body. In terms of some of the common tests, we obviously need to test the bone marrow, we need to have a look at these plasma cells, and we need to have a look at your blood, because that's where the problem is. So I'm sure you're all familiar with that test, the bone marrow aspirate and trephine, um, which unfortunately, at the minute, the only way to go and have a look inside the bone marrow is to actually take a sample of the bone marrow. Researchers and scientists are looking at ways to be able to do and find similar information on blood tests. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we hope that in the future we won't have to put patients through a bone marrow test um, for this disease. So we do bone marrow tests at diagnosis and periodically. We don't do them unnecessarily because we know they're invasive and people don't like having them. I wouldn't want to have one done, um, but it is critical because the only way to really have a look at those plasma cells is to go and get some from within the bone marrow and look at them under the microscope. It's far easier to look at the blood and have a blood simple blood test and that tells us a lot about the general health of the bone marrow the hemoglobin, the white cells, and the other components, and also the health of your kidneys and liver and other aspects. We do scans quite readily because I mentioned that myeloma can affect the bones in the body, and so you may have skeletal surveys or CTs or MRIs depending on which part of the body your doctor needs to have a look at. On the blood test, these pictures just show you some of the tests we do to have a look at the um, what we call the genetic test to look at the makeup 
makeup of these plasma cells um, to see what errors might be there that have contributed to this happening and for you having myeloma versus having normal healthy plasma cells. And these pictures just show the normal cytogenetic tests where we just literally have a look at all your chromosomes and see how normal or not they look. And a more recent one called the FISH test where we put probes into a sample of your bone marrow to identify particular abnormalities we know that can occur in the cells of people with myeloma um, um, uh, in, the, in the bone marrow. And those are tests that are um, commonly done at diagnosis and not necessarily through the rest of the course of your disease. I'm sure you're aware, and many people, my patients certainly are always very keen to understand what their myeloma protein or their myeloma bloods, their myeloma blood tests are. And this is also, as well as the bone marrow, a critical test for your doctors and nurses to understand how much myeloma you have um, and uh, how effective the treatment has been. And this is sort of the marker of your disease, what we might call your cancer marker. Um, thankfully, in most people, we can measure it in the blood or the urine. Um, some people, very few, maybe one or two percent, don't actually produce this extra marker, and we might have to do more bone marrow tests on those. But this test is looking for this um, protein that the abnormal myeloma cell makes, um, and this is what it looks like. It's an immunoglobulin made up of heavy chains and light chains, and this is produced in excess in people with myeloma, and we can measure for it, and we have tests, and we measure for it and call it an M protein, which you might say is a myeloma protein or it's a monoclonal protein. It's an abnormal protein and wouldn't be present in somebody without myeloma. And, and we do this at diagnosis at about once a month during the course of your treatment when um, of your myeloma, particularly when you're on treatment. It being there is an abnormality. The higher it is, the generally the more myeloma you have. The lower it is, generally the less myeloma you have. And we track it to know how well you are responding. There is a staging system for myeloma, which has been revised recently with new understandings around the cytogenetic abnormalities or the, the errors in the genes that occur at the time of you getting myeloma, not errors that occur at birth or inherited. And the, this staging system puts people into three categories. And it actually, having looked at thousands of samples from patients, we found there are two markers, a beta-2 microglobulin and your albumin, both important important proteins and markers in the body that tell us whether somebody has, has um, a lower pace myeloma or a higher pace myeloma, so grade one, two, and three. We match this with particular genetic abnormalities. We've identified some higher risk abnormalities. You don't really need to understand the specifics of these, but they're errors within the chromosomes that would tell us somebody has a higher risk myeloma. And at the minute, that is useful to tell us who we need to um, provide perhaps a more intensive treatment pathway to versus somebody whose myeloma may behave more indolently. Um, in the future, I think we'll be able to target drugs to match particular abnormalities, but at the minute we don't really um, do that. And we also have a staging system that helps us understand how much problem the myeloma is to your body, and we have a lovely acronym called CRAB, um, which stands for extra calcium, kidneys, anemia, and bone lesions. And your doctor sometimes uses that to know if you've got um, a, a M protein in your blood, um, but it's not causing you any crab features or problems, he may not need to treat you. But if you do have crab features, um, such as uh, problems with the bone and the kidneys, then that, is a, that helps them decide when to treat or when to treat more um, aggressively. So this is a system that we use um, predominantly at diagnosis rather than during the course. Some numbers are always very useful and people are always very interested. I do come from Australia, so I understand the numbers in Australia a little bit more, but in red are the New Zealand numbers. Myeloma is a rare cancer, um, but uh, with a incidence um, of seven or five, slightly more men than women have myeloma, the incidence in New Zealand and Australia is quite similar and is a little bit higher than some other Western countries, but not as high as North American um, black African 
Africans living in North America, males, it has the highest incidence. And I believe there is a slightly higher incidence, perhaps in some populations in New Zealand and Australia, um, but not too much. The average age at diagnosis is about 70. Saying that, we all have people in their 30s and 40s that we manage with myeloma, but on average. There's a large increase in the number of people with myeloma, and that's because of an aging of the population, not just because um, uh, that there are factors causing it. We're, we're aging as a society, and that's causing increases in numbers of people with illnesses in those age brackets. Um, although it remains an incurable um, condition, I don't have the silver bullet to tell you about today, but it is um, increasingly treatable with more treatment um, options coming online, more than many, many other cancers, actually. It's leading the way in that regard, and people are certainly living a lot longer with myeloma than when I started in this about 20 years ago. Um, survival, obviously, is, is um, depends on um, how you present with myeloma and how old. So somebody that presented in their 90s with myeloma um, wouldn't live as long as we would expect somebody in their 40s. And that's because we would treat them very, very differently. Um, and uh, that's the same for many other cancers. So in terms of <coughs> how we treat myeloma, we are, um, as doctors and nurses, we're governed by clinical practice guidelines and the variety of different best practice guidelines around the world. Um, you might be familiar with some of them. In our region, we have the Myeloma Scientific Advisory Group of Australia and New Zealand, um, made up of myeloma experts um, on both sides of the pond, and they have written these guidelines, which if you're interested, they're for clinicians, but you can access them, and they're available on the Myeloma Australia website. And these are written really to guide um, other hematologists and oncologists in understanding and, and making sense of, of what is a very uh, changeable f um, area in the treatment of myeloma, and it also lists some um, supportive measures, etc., that are recommended. So we're guided by these. The goals of treatment, as I mentioned, is not curable, so it is to treat the disease, um, and there's a variety of new drug and combinations to do that that I'll allude to. So, but to control and treat and prolong life, of course, but also to treat the symptoms of the disease, so to minimize any bone problems, to protect your kidneys, to help you not get infections, et cetera, and to also minimize the burden of the treatment that we give you in terms of the side effects that you may well experience, so as to maximize your quality of life and have you all running the city of surf to surf next year with Eva. Um, the disease does follow a relapsing remitting path, and by that I mean there'll be periods of time where you have active disease needing active treatment, and hopefully there'll be periods of time where your disease is stable, um, maybe in a form of remission or response, and you might not need any treatment at all, um, and that path is um, ongoing. When we look at that, and I'm, I'm just to demonstrate to you the sort of relapsing, remitting journey, this is uh, a patient of ours, and I've just used that M protein to track their journey with myeloma over many years. And the boxes, the blue and green line shows this abnormal protein and immunoglobulin in the blood, and the boxes show the different treatment this person's had, and in between there are periods of not having any treatment and a degree of stability. And this is a common journey for most people with myeloma, periods of treatment and periods of not having treatment and stability. So it is, it can be, it's not really a marathon, it can be a sprint and a marathon and a rest and then a sprint, a marathon, and a rest. But myeloma can be very different in different people. So although this is one of our patients, this is another patient of ours with myeloma. And you can see when we track their myeloma protein, they had high levels at diagnosis, and we hit them with some chemotherapy and a transplant. And then that protein has gone, gone away or been very, very low and has not been causing problems. And that person's not had any more treatment yet. And that was a period of eight or nine years. So so this, although this isn't isn't um, isn't the average, it certainly happens. And somewhere between that last slide and this slide is a likely journey um, for people with myeloma. We have an increasing number. When I started with myeloma um, many years ago in London, we had a drug called melphalan. 
And that's all we had to treat people with myeloma, and that's the first drug on the list. And now we have all these different drugs, and these are ones that, the, the ones I've included are those that are sort of more available, be it on a study or a trial or through Pharmac or the PBS, um, and supportive measures, um, which are also improving as fast as the treatments. But there's a whole host of other targets and drugs that are coming through that we're not yet really accessing that much. So a huge increase just in 20 years, which in medicine is actually not that long a period of time. So the combinations of treatment that we use generally is a combination. We don't usually use one drug at a time. We usually package them together. And we find that a combination of perhaps a chemotherapy medication, a steroid, and then a myeloma-specific targeted drug, um, is, is, and we call that a triplet combination, is a common way to go. A range of supportive measures exist, and we'll talk about some of those. And those are about keeping those crab features at bay, looking after your bone, your blood, your immune system. I'm happy for people to have these slides, and it's being filmed as a resource. So if you're not capturing all of this information and you need it, don't worry, you can get it afterwards. When we put that together in a picture, this is a common pathway for patients with myeloma. And the first question we ask at diagnosis, really, is how fit is this person? Um, as, as the hematologists age, the upper age limit of fitness goes up as well, as they realize uh, they're in their 70s and they would like to be treated optimally as well. But we have a sort of intensive and non-intensive pathway. And it's not really age-defined, although there's an arbitrary 65 to 70 on that, uh, on that fence line, but it's about how fit you are. And the, the goal is to get control of this, this, this disease and keep you well and functioning. So there is a tip point at which if we put you through too much intensive treatment, we're likely to make you sicker. We might actually get rid of the myeloma, but we'll probably get rid of you or half of you on the way. So we do need to make that distinction about how intensive we want to treat you. And the two different paths are really going through high dose therapy and a transplant or not. Okay, And it's about a 50-50 split, if you think the average diagnosis age is about 70. So if you, and then the path people tend to follow are to have some treatment at diagnosis to, called induction to get um, on, in control of the disease, to consolidate that with a transplant or some more treatment, and to maintain those gains with some maintenance or just active surveillance and monitoring of your blood and keeping you healthy otherwise. We use a variety of combinations quite commonly here and in New Zealand, we use a bortezomib, which is Velcade-based regimen, sometimes packaged with chemo and steroid at the beginning to gain control, whichever path you're on. If you're on the intensive path, we may consolidate that by putting you through a transplant, and there's some um, sessions about that, and I'll, I have one slide about what that is, but we won't go into that in too much detail. We basically give you a high dose of chemo, reboot uh, the blood system. And then if you're not going through a transplant, we just continue with the regimen that you're on for a little bit longer. Um, in terms of the maintenance that we may give you to keep things at bay, you may or may not have some tablet maintenance after a transplant um, to keep that protein level very low, or you might just have your blood monitored and regular checkups with your doctor. But that's a common pathway for people with a diagnosis. We run through briefly the different treatments that are available. There are some immune modulators or, or tablet versions which aim to kill the myeloma and control the myeloma. The most common ones known are thalidomide, lenalidomide, otherwise known as Revlimid. There are trade and generic names for these things. And pomalidomide, which we've just got access to in Australia and hopefully will be coming soon with some access more readily um, here in New Zealand. These are tablet medications, sometimes packaged with others, so they're more convenient to take. You don't have to be coming into the hospital to have infusions and injections, and they're given in certain um, indications in certain ways. 
Very common side effects to these drugs are listed here. Thalidomide, the most common one I have, prob well, not me, I don't take it, but my patients, is constipation and sleepiness. It was originally developed as a sedative for morning sickness, so it is a sedative. So you do need to take it at night and be wary of the need to monitor your bowels and maybe take some laxatives for that. You take it every night ongoing, every day, um, to keep the myeloma at bay. Sometimes we can package it with some other things as well. Lenalidomide was the next generation in this class of drug. It's also a tablet and therefore more convenient. You take it three weeks out of every four. And the reason you always have a break is to allow the healthy blood to just take a breather. Because this drug helps to dampen down the myeloma in the bone marrow, but it can dampen down some of the healthy cells as well. So one week out of every four, you have a break so that the healthy blood can just um, have a breather and um, come back up to its normal values, OK? You only get tw uh, three weeks in a packet, so you can't really overdo it in the medication that you have. Um, common side effects are dampening down of the immune system, so lowering of some of those blood counts, and we keep an eye on that, taking regular blood tests as well. I'm happy to talk to anybody um, about side effects of these drugs afterwards. Um, and pomalidomide is very similar to lenalidomide in how it's taken and how we monitor it and some of the side effects. Just because these drugs are in the same class, it doesn't mean that if one drug has stopped working for you, that the next drug in the class would not work. That's not the case. They are molecularly very different to each other, and we certainly can, you can pass through all the different drugs um, as you can get access to them. Um, bortezomib, otherwise known as Valcade, is another drug that we use. You might be quite familiar with this. It's um, given as a subcutaneous injection uh, in the tummy once or twice a week, depending on what schedule your doctor has you on. And we usually use it in combination with some other tablets as well. Common side effects include neuropathy and, um, and lowering of some of the blood counts, and you'd be having blood tests regularly, and I'm sure your doctor would be asking you about side effects of neuropathy. I'm not going to labor these drugs particularly. I'm happy to take questions afterwards. The autologous transplant is uh, where we use a uh, dose of melphalan, a big dose of melphalan, um, to, to kill off the myeloma cells and then uh, reinfuse the stem cells that we've collected um, previously to sort of reboot your blood system and clear it out of myeloma. And that's commonly indicated in patients who are fit enough to go through that procedure. It requires a hospital stay. It's pretty intensive. Um, it knocks you about a fair bit. It. So we don't do it unless we think we're going to get some benefit out of it, and we're not going to make you more unwell afterwards. Um, but if, if your doctor does recommend it, it is um, known to improve the outcomes for myelomas, so it's commonly done. I'm just going to move now to talk a little bit about some of the supportive care um, to look after the other components, uh, bone, kidneys, and immune system, which are critically important to keep people well with myeloma. I mentioned that myeloma can affect bone, uh, and I also mentioned that we all regrow a skeleton, so I'm on at least my fifth skeleton, I don't know about you guys. Um, but what happens in the blood, in the body, is that there are always cells growing and regenerating, and that is the same for bone. So we have two types of bone cell osteoclasts and osteoblasts, and they're growing uh, bone and breaking down bone and growing new bone. And what happens with these myeloma cells or these plasma cells in the bone marrow is they upset that balance, okay? So bones, bone is broken down faster than it can be made up, and that can leave you with little holes or thinning of the bone. So having x-rays and scans and being mindful of your bones are a very important part of treating myeloma. It's critical that we keep on top of this. Um, we do a variety of different scans. There are changing space in terms of what scans we use for which people. Um, but uh, plain x-rays, CT scans, MRI scans, and even sometimes PET CT scans can be used, um, depending on which part of your body is affected, um, uh, and your doctor would be best to discuss that with you. I'm sure many of you have had these scans um, to monitor your um, myeloma disease. In terms of how we treat bone disease, we need to treat the myeloma. 
because it's the active myeloma cells that are causing disruption to bone. So generally speaking, you're more at risk of bone disease when your myeloma is active. If your myeloma is not active and is indolent or in remission, it's very unusual to get new bone problems. Okay, so treat the myeloma is a key part of treating bone disease. Bone disease can cause pain, and I'm sure many of you have had direct experience with that. So managing the symptoms of pain whilst we get on top of the underlying cause is also a big part of managing bone disease. There are a group of drugs called bisphosphonates, which are bone strengtheners, zoledrenic acid, pomidronate, some tablets as well. Those will be an important part of your treatment of your myeloma. And uh, your doctor will be best placed to recommend which ones you have and for how long. We also need to consider general health, such as the potential need for calcium and vitamin supplements, um, the bone strengthening drugs can cause a rare condition called osteonecrosis of the jaw, which um, can occur in all patients taking bisphosphonates, even women who have it for osteoporosis. Um, it is a rare condition, less than 5%, but the way to reduce the risk of that on these drugs is to avoid tooth extractions and dental surgery that exposes bone. But if you do need to have some dental surgery or a tooth extraction, and you are taking these drugs, you do need to let your dentist know and your hematologist know because you might need to have a little bit of a, a holiday off the bone strengtheners in order to have the dental procedures, okay? We don't see a lot of it. It is quite rare, but it's important to know. We use radiotherapy if people have a painful bone lesion caused by active myeloma, and we sometimes call that a bit of spot welding. We use radiation to target a very specific area of the body and zap it with radiation to kill the myeloma cells. It can be very effective to treat myeloma bone pain. There is also a procedure called vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty, where we can inject some cement into a vertebra that might have um, collapsed due to weakness. Um, and some of you may or may not have had that done. Um, and we incre increasingly, um, we use our orthopedic surgeons and doctors to help us intervene if somebody has, say, a hip that has a lot of myeloma um, damage and we think it might be at risk of fracturing or something. We don't wait for that to happen. If there's an at-risk joint, we commonly would um, recommend that patients see a surgeon and might need to have um, some surgical repair of a joint so that we can keep you optimally healthy and functioning. So that's not uncommon um, these days too. I mentioned the kidneys can be at risk and they're at risk because these M protein, uh, they're more at risk when your M protein is higher, less at risk when it is lower, but always consider kidney health. So the M protein can just get stuck and clog up the kidney and then that kidney doesn't work appropriately. Um, other things that can cause the kidney to be damaged are becoming dehydrated, having a nasty infection, not necessarily in the kidney, having a nasty pneumonia can put stress on the kidney, and medications. Anything you take into your body needs to be processed by the kidney or liver as it passes out. So be wary. We would be very conscious of the medications we give you and the potential to cause kidney harm. But there are other things that you would ingest that we're not aware of. So um, for example, over-the-counter medications, medications for other health conditions, supplements and herbs can be very harmful to the kidney. So do let your doctor know um, everything that you're taking, not just the ones that he's prescribing, so that we can give you the best advice as to whether that might cause harm to the kidney. If you do have a scan and the imaging person wants to give you an injection of a dye to help the scan be optimized, you do need to just put your hand up and say, can you check with my doctor? Because these dyes can be harmful to the kidney and we commonly prefer patients with myeloma and not to have those dyes. Okay, so that's worth keeping in mind. In terms of uh, how we manage the risk of kidney problems, reducing the risk. So be mindful of what you're taking on board. Make sure you're letting your doctor know about any supplements or herbs you may want to take as well as the medicines. Keep well hydrated. One of the best things you can do for your own health is to drink plenty of water, which is why there are 
bottles and bottles of it at the back of the room. Two to two and a half litres a day are optimal, um, and particularly as the weather gets hotter. Um, in terms of we would be reducing your risk by monitoring your bloods and your uh, regularly and uh, avoiding drugs that damage. Um, and if you did have a very high M protein, the potential to risk kidney is there and we'd want to get that down very, very quickly and we use certain drugs to do that. A small number of people may require dialysis if they, their kidneys fail completely and that doesn't mean we can't treat their myeloma, we just need to be extra cautious and manage the dialysis at the same time as all the other things. Just a few words on the immune system. Myeloma is a cancer of the immune system. So it is not surprising um, that recurrent infections and, and the uh, uh, need to reduce infections is very important for people living with myeloma. Okay, You not only have lower levels of normal cells in the blood that help you fight infection, but these antibodies or immunoglobulins are, are the clever fellas in the immune system, and they recognize infections and things that you come exposed to and put up a response to it, but then lower normally. So you need to understand the signs and symptoms of an infection, and I'm sure you've all got a thermometer at home. If not, you need to buy one on the way home. And you need to be mindful of reducing your risk of infections. The magic marker for when your doctors and nurses need to know is if you have a temperature above 38, you do need to see somebody, a GP, or if you're on treatment or you've got very low counts, you might need to check in directly with your hospital team. Um, periods of increased risk when you're on treatment, you're at a higher risk than when you when your myeloma is behaving and you're not on treatment. Particularly when you've just started, if you've had a big dose of chemo, such as coming out of a transplant, or in the first few cycles of starting a new treatment, is a particularly at-risk period of time. Reducing the risk, your doctor might recommend some antibiotics to prevent infections, and we might call that prophylactic. Do take um, your supportive measures or your supportive medications as seriously as the treatment medications. They are critical to minimize further problems. Have your flu jab each year plus the people in your family. You really should have that. We're having a shocking flu season in Australia, and particularly in Sydney. Um, and these things um, on an annual basis really can help keep you healthy and minimize the risk. Um, we here have a, a very key member of our team. This dog is actually, Bonnie is on our payroll at RPA. Um, I think a human takes the paycheck, but the, 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 the um, speed at which Bonnie is growing, I know she's getting more treats than she used to. Um, but care also around pets and family and, and things like that. And these sort of alcohol gels are really good to have um, uh, around in the car, in your handbag at home. So if you're out and about and you've had a snack and then you're doing something else you, and you can't wash your hands, you can keep your hands clean with these alcohol rubs. We'll finish by talking about some of the side effects and then we'll have a few slides at some of the treatments that are coming along and then have some time for questions and hear about what people want to know in this group. So these are the pillars of the treatment. Uh, commonly we have thalidomide, as I've mentioned, lenalidomide or revlimid, pomalist is coming and velcade. So one, two, three are the more common ones that we use. And listed down the left-hand side there are some of the common side effects that we keep our eye on um, and focus on to try and reduce these so that you can live better with myeloma but also keep adherent to the treatment you're having because drugs only work if you take them, um, which makes a lot of sense, but um, sometimes it can be hard to do that. So neuropathy is quite common. We're going to talk about that. Um, there is an increased risk of having blood clots when you have a health condition and as we age. So some medicines put you at increased risk, particularly thalidomide and lenalidomide. So your doctor is likely to recommend an aspirin or a blood thinner, or if you have other risk factors, you may well be on a heparin or a warfarin or something like that. And that is just to optimize your blood health and reduce the risk of clots, uh, which can make you sick. Lowered blood Blood counts are common as well. We've mentioned infections are more higher risk of getting them and likely to be more severe when your blood counts are lowered. And so we keep an eye on those. So if your doctor's asking you to have a blood test regularly so he can keep an eye on that, do make sure you have those tests because so that we can monitor and keep things safe and intervene when we can. Cardio, cardiopulmonary are quite rare and more linked to some of the newer drugs that uh, we don't have as much access to. So I won't talk too 
too much about that. Um, fatigue and weakness across the board. I think having myeloma is just fatigue making in itself and certainly all the hospital visits and the treatment um, and when you're anemic it's quite common to be fatigued and the best thing for that is to keep active and have a plan to keep mobile and exercise is the best thing for fatigue somewhat counterintuitively. Um, and then some GI disturbances we might talk about. So let's talk about peripheral neuropathy. Who in the room has got a degree of neuropathy would they say? Lots of hands going up. Yeah, lots of hands. It very, very common in myeloma um, because of the protein, but also because of the treatment. So what is neuropathy? Neuropathy is damage to nerves, changing the way in which the nerves work and function. And nerves work and function, we have them all over our body to help us um, sense things. So sensory neuropathy, where we can feel hot and cold and what something feels like, but also motor nerves that help us move and function and uh, get strength and autonomic nerves that help things function without us thinking about it. So such as breathing and pulse and blood pressure and your gut moving and digesting, all supplied by nerves. So if there are things that cause damage to nerves, that can be quite a wide range of symptoms that you can feel. In myeloma, when we have neuropathy caused by some of the drugs, commonly it starts at the tips of the fingers and toes and is the similar on both sides. Um, but it can be very varied between people. We see it in myeloma because the M protein can damage nerves, okay? So at diagnosis, you might have a little bit. But there's a whole range of other health conditions that cause neuropathy, not least aging. Um, but diabetes, high alcohol consumption, some vitamin deficiencies, etc. So there are lots of other reasons. It's not just the myeloma and the drugs we give. But the most common in myeloma are the drugs thalidomide, Valcade and vincristine, which is a chemo drug we don't give as commonly. So we're very mindful when we give patients these drugs. The symptoms of neuropathy are listed here for you, and I won't labor them, just to mention the tingling in the pins and needles and numbness, your feet feeling cold, things like that are very common signs of neuropathy, and your doctor will be talking to you about them. But also other things such as postural hypertension, so feeling a bit wobbly when you stand up too quickly and walking into walls and things like that also can be signs and symptoms. I have some patients that get a bit of tinnitus. That can be caused by neuropathy as well, ringing in the ears. So a whole range of different things that um, your doctor might ask you about. And if you have any of these, you need to talk to your doctor about them as well to see if there's a way. There are some um, common questionnaires and, and uh, assessments that we can use. And I would recommend anybody who does have a problem with this or wants to read more access, there's the Peripheral Neuropathy Booklet on the Myeloma Association of Australia website. And the link is there for you. It gives you lots of information about how to manage it. Key to managing it from our point of view is to, uh, is to make sure we're measuring it, we're getting a baseline measurement, and we're preventing it coming on, and we're certainly preventing it escalating. So we, if we do understand that you have these signs and symptoms, we start to look at dose reducing um, or changing the way we give these drugs that are causing this, and maybe even having to stop the drugs that are contributing to this, because you can be left with a degree of neuropathy even when we stop the drugs that are causing it and that can be um, uh, limiting in many ways. Patients have a range of different things that they recommend, such as um, using menthol-based creams, foot massages, Epsom salts as magnesium, and magnesium supplements can be very helpful for cramping and neuropathy. And there is also a range of supplements that are listed, um, and you can access that through the Myeloma, um, the International Myeloma Foundation website. They have a list of supplements. There's not a lot of high science behind this, but if anybody wants that list, um, do check with your pharmacist and your doctor first to make sure there's no interactions, and then some people do find they can be quite helpful, um, and you can get that list. We'll just finish looking at um, uh, steroid effects and then end on some of the future directions for myeloma. So along with all the treatment for myeloma, pretty much a steroid comes with every regimen, and they can cause um, some troubling effects, okay? They kill myeloma cells, and they make the other drugs work better. So they are a key component of treatment. But there's a whole range of things because these steroids are hormones that we produce naturally and do a very good job in helping balance and control a whole range of things. But they can cause problems with blood pressure and muscle strength and things. And 
more importantly, they can actually be quite disturbing to your mood and your emotions. And people can get energized or edgy or uh, and feel a bit high and low in mood when they take these drugs. Um, and just understanding that it's the drugs that can cause these changes is the key to managing those. Okay, but if you are really um, having some troubles with these steroids and you're finding it's really upsetting your daily life, you do need to talk to your doctor about the potential for reducing the dose of these drugs. The best way to minimize these risks is to reduce the dose of the drug, but key to the drug is that it is actually helping your myeloma. So your doctor might want to push through with a higher dose for a little bit of time to get on hold of a disease if you've got a very high M protein. But we do use um, strategies such as make, um, exercise and relaxation to help people manage some of these side effects. I am going to run out of time, so I would like to start, um, end with a few slides looking at what's ahead in myeloma, particularly around some of the treatment. So myeloma, um, it, when it's treated and gets under control, and hopefully you have a period of time where you're not on treatment, it will always come back um, invariably. And so we need to have a plan for the next time and use another course of treatment. What treatment you would have when the myeloma comes back depends on a whole range of different things. Um, but those uh, goals that I mentioned at the beginning still apply. Depends on your general fitness, uh, the availability of drugs, what's worked before, um, if there's a new drug available on a clinical trial, um, and uh, any side effects that you may have, and the doctor may want to reduce the risk of causing harm with some of those side effects we've mentioned. Availability of a clinical trial and a study is key because we access in Australia and New Zealand a lot of these new agents for myeloma in the context of a study. So it really is a good way to get access to some of these drugs that are very high cost and not available through um, the reimbursed process in either of our countries. But the combinations that we use are built on those pillars of those drugs, the imids, the thalidomide, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, when we can get hold of it. Um, sometimes we can... Um, uh, um, mix them up in a different combination and use them again, and then newer drugs, which I'll allude to, um, including monoclonal antibodies called daratumumab, elatuzumab, isotuzumab, and I do know there have been some studies in New Zealand and in Australia giving access to these drugs. These really are exciting new drugs that target the myeloma in a very different way, and we're very keen to get our hands on them, and I think you might be getting your hands on some of these drugs um, in, uh, soon in New Zealand as we are hopeful in Australia, uh, particularly daratumumab, which is, is, is going to be quite a game changer in the field of myeloma treatment, um, but a whole range of other things coming through. This I'm not going to go through, don't worry, don't fear, but just to show you that this myeloma cell, this beast that exists in our bone marrow, scientists and researchers are working very hard to figure out what makes this grow and what keeps it alive, and they are finding a huge huge a range of targets and pathways in the science of what keeps this drug alive and that is what is fueling all these new targets in these drugs so all the drug all the, the names you can't really see around here are all new drugs and targets coming through for the treatment of myeloma in red we pretty much have them in green they're coming but there's a whole range in black that are just coming behind them so i wanted to show you this slide to show you that there really is a huge amount of treatment and options and targets to treat this disease going forward. Um, so it is a very exciting time in the management of myeloma going ahead. Um, future um, uh, options are going to include new types of existing classes of drugs. So we have new types of Velcade, um, carfilzomib, exasimib that are all thought to work a little bit better and hopefully be less toxic and more convenient for you. Completely new classes of drug like the monoclonal antibodies I mentioned, daratumumab is likely to be a game changer, and there's a whole range of them coming through behind that. But what is most exciting, but a little ahead, um, are the immune approaches, such as uh, CAR T-cell work, which has had some great success in some of the other blood cancers at a very, very early stages, guys, very early 
stages. And this is where we use, we harness your own immune system to fight your own cancer. There are some early studies going on in the United States in myeloma. The approach is incredibly expensive and incredibly toxic. So we want our folks in the US to get some practice and learn how to do it. Um, and then we'll jump on the bus when they've got the approach tweaked. Um, so it's not quite there in myeloma, but this is the near future in the management of myeloma. It's a very exciting time. Um, in terms, I'm just going to leave you with some resources you may well know very well, um, but there is a huge amount of information out there from a range of reputable organisations, not least the Leukemia and Blood Cancer Society here, Myeloma Australia. Um, everything I've spoken about is available through these organisations and is readily available for you to download. Um, and I think we probably have about two and a half minutes left for questions, um, but, uh, and I'd be happy to take those now. Thank you. Thank you.